It's the Opperman Report. Join digital forensic investigator and PI Ed Opperman for an in-depth discussion of conspiracy theories, strategy of New World Order resistance, high-profile court cases in the news, and interviews with expert guests and authors on these topics and more. It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator, Ed Opperman, and this show is brought to you by emailrevealer.com. Okay, got a very special show for you today. We're speaking today with Cortland Dahl. His blog is called survivalcell.blogspot.com. And we're talking about two of his books mo- mostly here, Timeless Arcadia Treasure, Myths and Legends Revealed, An Examination of Arcadian Treasure and Stories. And the other one is Oak Island and Arcadian Mysteries. Years ago, and I started writing about odd aspects of history. And when I first started out, I kind of my first question was, why did Thomas Jefferson build octagonal structures? I used to live in Virginia, and that was always curious to me that he favored that form. And really, that just opened up a whole literal Pandora's box of of other mysterious things and uh, Masonic quest and initiation legends and and Rosicrucian concepts. And it just, uh, you know, flowered out to where it included these lost treasure stories like at Rain Le Chateau in France, uh, another one at Shugborough Hall in England, and of course, the Oak Island treasure. That it did actually lead me to Oak Island after I had studied the other two places in relation to looking at this lineage of octagonal structures that go back to the Tower of the Winds of Athens and subsequent structures as well that were all seemingly meant to define a line of longitude. And this jived with what I found out about Jefferson because he created what were, quote, personal meridians at both his home Poplar Forest and Monticello. And they both have these octagonal designs to them. So he he was really um, fascinated with that. And so as I began to just look at at how these towers were used through history, I found that they, they were at one point called Magdalas in uh, reference to Mary Magdalene or Mary of Magdala because Magdala actually translates right to fish tower. Hmm. So that's a form of it. And then as things progressed and alchemy and Rosicrucian thought became more of the, the vogue of the day there in the late 16th and early 17th centuries that a lot of astrologers would build what was known of as an alchemical tower based on the same thing because we know astrology does involve fixing one's position on the earth and that relates to the the horoscopes that are given so there's a lot of connections to this in in geography even in in kind of an occult or hidden way or way that's been forgotten over time to where today people don't realize this and I found there's a lot of interest in the stories I found related to all that well, well, let me ask you this. If Jefferson had access to this knowledge, where did he learn it? I think he learned it from his family. At first, I, I didn't catch on to that. His mother's Randolph family was connected to a lot of interesting history in the area of uh, Queen Elizabeth in England, where this concept of Arcadia came to be appreciated by nobles and other people who were interested in uh, what we're talking about that the Arcadian mythology of Greece involves the mythological character Arcus eventually being cast into the sky as Ursa Minor by Zeus and the tale of Ursa Minor contains the pole star so that's a astronomical reference point that's the zero point that all astronomy refers to and the way maps are even made Um, spatially on the earth but Thomas Jefferson amazingly was related to a man named Philip Sidney who wrote a book called Arcadia and this is one of those pieces of literature that I found that people seem to have taken plot elements of the book and made them a reality over time and I think Thomas Jefferson was aware of this due to his family connection 
to Philip Sidney, which even came through the, quote, spy master of Elizabethan England, who was associated with Dr. John Dee. His name was Sir Francis Walsingham. So Jefferson's forebearer was Thomas Randolph, a diplomat associated with the intelligence service at that time. And uh, he was Walsingham's brother-in-law. So Philip Sidney was Walsingham's son-in-law. So we do have a direct family relation between Thomas Jefferson and Philip Sidney, even though it's not a blood relation. And through studying the Randolph family in Virginia, I became aware that they did indeed value this. They would name their homes Wilton House, for instance, over the house where Philip Sidney wrote the book Arcadia. Uh, subsequent family members were named Philip Sidney Randolph and Algernon Sidney Randolph, which is interesting because Algernon Sidney was also one of Jefferson's inspirations in the Declaration of Independence. His writing had been. So there was a definite real value on the part of Jefferson's family in this kind of history in which they had been intimately involved, and it's obvious that they appreciated this even a few hundred years later uh, when Thomas Jefferson was born. So and, all of that's – go ahead. Yeah, what did he achieve, though? What was the benefit from this? Well, it's, it's all kind of a, a, a mystery school uh, kind of initiatory thing that if you knew you were in on the in crowd and you could actually interpret – uh, some of the things that maybe royalty was doing in reference uh, to what I mentioned about them making plot elements of Philip Sidney's book a reality. And the, the first instance of that is in the book are these two octagonal structures that are discussed called Pamela's Lodge. That actually when Philip Sidney passed away, Star Castle on the Isles of Scilly in England was made based on the description of one of these octagonal lodges in the book. It was kind of a commemorative thing or out of respect. And as I researched that, it was actually a cousin of Philip Sidney's that had had the structure built. So this was, at first, this was an, an instance from the book that was a form of respect that will build this structure similar to the ones that were in the book. But then... I also found, which is interesting, during the time of Charles I, here, here's another English monarch that had an um, interest in the, that book specifically. As Queen Elizabeth, of course, Star Castle was built under her auspices or her administration as well. And she dictated that that should be built as well. So if we cut to about 1649, just at the end of the English Civil War, or near the end of it, we have Charles I consulting Virgil's Aeneid via bibliomancy, which is where you open a book to a random page and use that to interpret a possible future, somewhat like tarot cards or astrology or things like that. And the passage that he had selected did suggest his imminent doom right here near the end of the war they were having between the parliamentarians and the uh, monarchy at that time. So he eventually loses the war, and then just before he's be beheaded, he quotes Pamela's prayer from the pages of Philip Sidney's Arcadia, which is generally Pamela's prayer as a plea for religious tolerances, because part of the problems Charles I was having was his Catholic wife there was a lot of hidden Catholics, quote unquote, in England at that time. So we actually have the monarchy at this point pleading for religious freedom or tolerance based on Catholics being banned in England. So it's interesting that he chose to quote from Philip Sidney's book in that instance. So after I found these two tidbits out, <laughs> I decided to actually read the book and word searched the book book also for pertinent terms and I lo and behold I found a story written in this book that was first printed in 1580 that was almost exactly like the story of the three young men finding the money pit on Oak Island Wow so here based on what I had already found I'm starting to think well this is part of this tradition of kind of actualizing things from the book 
And, 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 and everything you're describing to us right now can be found in your latest book, Timelines, Arcadia, Treasure, Myths and Legends Revealed, an Examination of Arcadian Treasure Stories. Yes, all that's in there, and it's also a lot of uh, that is also in my last book called Oak Island and the Arcadian Mysteries. Gotcha. As well. And there's a lot of the uh, articles on my blog uh, for free that will explain all this too. And it uh, actually included the portion of the book that resembles the Oak Island story where a man is sent on an errand to find this treasure, and he is sent to a treasure pit beneath an oak tree which he excavates, and they even comment as he's doing this that it appeared the pit had been dug up and then refilled again, similar to the Oak Island story. And when he gets to the bottom, there's a, a graven stone or an inscribed stone that's similar to the, quote, 90-foot stone in Oak Island lore. So the, the, the whole it even mentions golden acorns and all these other references that will make you think Oak Island right away when you read this. Well, then what, so, what, what's the significance of that? Well, that, that somebody put this treasure there and made it look like the similar treasure pit in the story, knowing that I think possibly if somebody had read the book and been aware of this, they might have their doubts about the authenticity of the treasure. And on the other hand, it may suggest to them the kind of uh, Masonic overtones that the money pit has in the nine layers of logs with the stone at the bottom is reflective of the story of Enoch in the apocryphal gospels, building the nine layered arched vaults with the uh, triangular stone at the bottom that includes the unspoken name of God. Hmm. So th this is a concept that a lot of people use to uh, suggest there is nothing at Oak Island that it was kind of some sort of Masonic initiatory ritual just in the way the story is told, not necessarily in reality because we don't know enough about that. But a lot of these things do have Rosicrucian overtones related to kind of the core tenet of Rosicrucian philosophy in that Christian Rosenkreutz is entombed in an unknown, unknown location with a library of sacred information and a treasure. So a lot of this, I believe, is meant to appeal to people with that kind of uh, bent or that kind of uh, philosophy in their lives. So the, crea the creation of this uh, 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 representation of a, of a treasure burial was some type of a religious ritual? Well, I would say it's more of a, a – a, if you look at it from the view of it, it similar to the story of Enoch, yes – I mean, that's one of the Gospels that's not included in, in the Western Christian thought, but it is part of the canon of the Ethiopian church mm. and other places. So with somebody trying to tell you a story like that, a lot of people who know about that would immediately recognize, wow, that's really similar to the, the part of the Book of Enoch where he builds the nine-layered vaulted arches and everything. So that doesn't mean there's no treasure there, because it's interesting that a lot of what they found in Philip Sidney's book, for instance, at the bottom of the pit was just parchments mm. that with poetry written on them. And so what they have actually found there at depth is pieces of parchment that are older and pieces of book binding. So to me, that's one of the largest things or biggest things that keeps me hanging on that there actually could be something more at Oak Island. I used to be a real skeptic about that, but when they started to find the parchments, that this kind of conforms to what's in, not only what's in Philip Sidney's book Arcadia, but what is part of Rosicrucian lore with the story of Christian Rosenkreutz. And that I think this led later to a lot of people speculating that Sir Francis Bacon's papers are there, right. or he's entombed there, and that could be the real reason for the story. But I guess the point of it is, is we're giving a story that has these associations with a book written in 1580, Philip Sidney's Arcadia, and the Book of Enoch would attract people who were aware of those things to the Oak Island treasure. Now, let me ask you this. I had uh, Lee Lamb on the show years ago before she ever even uh, was on the TV show. 
And uh, I asked her if she thought they would ever find anything with all the searching they're doing right now. And she kind of chuckled and said, that island is Swiss cheese. They've looked everywhere. <laughs> what, is your, what is your take? It is. I think that the, the parts they really haven't been able to examine are their efforts to, to lower these big cans, you know, these big pipes down into the ground to find whatever's there at depth. And that's the biggest thing hampering them is there's no way to get down there uh, to see what's there beyond probing the way they are, which in effect could destroy anything that's there right. too. But the, the notion that nothing is there, I do understand why people think that. And some of what I found does support that notion in that it's a suggestive of older mythology, older stories in books that... Uh, Frankly, the, the Stuart royal family of England were the ones who had the kind of habit of creating real historical events that seemed to match what was in the book. And to me, this even includes the Newport Tower. And, and what is the Newport Tower? Well, the Newport Tower is another one of these sites in Newport, Rhode Island, where a lot of people claim that Vikings left it there or Knights Templar is another popular notion right now in, in kind of unknown history, but we do have a record of the first governor of Rhode Island, Benedict Arnold, the forebearer of the famous traitor later in the Revolutionary War, calling it his stone-built windmill in his will. So a lot of the people who want to claim it's older or something else just ignore that part of the story. <laughs> And, and kind of uh, want to claim it's Norse because in the 19th century there was a the Norwegian Romantic Nationalist movement that kind of promoted a lot of history like that in North America that necessarily may not have been true. So in my analysis, in Philip Sidney's book, Arcadia, there's two octagonal star-shaped lodges, quote, connected by the tail of a comet. So what we see is that Charles the first, who was the son of, I mean Charles the second, who was the son of Charles the first. Charles the first again had quoted from the book just before he was beheaded, and when Charles the second was exiled from England during the English Civil War, he first spent two months on the Isles of Scilly at Star Castle, which I mentioned earlier had been built after the description of the star-shaped lodge in Philip Sidney's book. So it's interesting that he ended up there when just a, a few years later his father would be quoting from the book and before he's beheaded. Hmm. So Charles I goes off to France and spends 10 years, and then England decides they want a king back. So he comes back at the Restoration in about 1660, and within a few years, Charles I is giving Rhode Island a very liberal charter that guarantees them religious freedom, which is the same theme of Pamela's prayer that his father quoted from Philip Sidney's book. So when I uh, reason that all out, it seems to me that Benedict Arnold built this structure, which does have astronomical qualities, like an orologion similar to the Tower of the Winds of Athens that I mentioned before, that um, this was built in veneration of Charles I at the behest of his son, Charles II. And what's really amazing, when I always check these things later on Google Earth, the octagonal form of Star Castle on the Isles of Scilly, act its orientation actually creates an arc on the globe that points to or leads to the Newport Tower in Newport, Rhode Island. Let me ask you this about these octagonal structures. Is there anything else significant, like altars inside or hidden rooms or maybe things buried underneath them? Well, they are associated with a lot of occult concepts, especially later when, when alchemists and astro uh, astrologers begin to use them kind of as observatories. And that's what we're seeing. These things are kind of crude observatories or points on the Earth where a line of longitude can be established that aids astronomers in comparing their readings with other points on earth and oh, then they can even, yeah then they can even spatially define 
the relationship from one observatory to the other and then places in between. And this is kind of the beginning of, of nobility having a way to define their domain in, in a graphic way on a piece of paper, like the early uh, beginnings of mapping things. Now, another question I wanted to ask you, and I, I got so many notes here. As you talk, I make all these little notes. You know, <laughs> this, sure, sure. That's great. Um, domes. We see domed structures throughout the world too, and throughout uh, the United States and political uh, buildings and stuff. What, what, do you, what is the significance of that, these domed structures? Well, I've read things about that. I've never addressed that directly myself, but a lot of people believe in, quote, earth energies. Hmm. Like it, that's the difference maybe between what a ley line is considered and a line or arc on the globe that's used to define the world spatially, that these are more spiritually oriented where some people claim they can feel energy from that. And that's a religious concept that was involved in, in uh, the construction of the medieval cathedrals in Europe. Uh, and this is just a theory, but I believe that's one of the reasons that became a kind of vogue for a powerful structure like the capital or the Hagia Sophia in, in Istanbul and all of these classic church designs that include domes. So that could be one of the reasons of that. And, and in effect, some of those structures operate in the same way that I'm suggesting with an octagonal central bell tower or something like that where uh, the church was in interested in these things for accurate timekeeping so they would know what day Easter was on each year or all the other feast days and holidays like Christmas so the church also invested themselves in this and in fact if you go to St. Peter's Square at the Vatican you'll see the Egyptian obelisk in the middle and then it's surrounded by a circle of what is known as windrose markers that have compass directions on them Every 22 and a half degrees, there's a windrose marker. So that's an octagonal array right there that is reminiscent of the Tower of the Winds in Athens. That, that was built between 250 B.C. And um, each corner and facet of that structure had an associated deity, a god of the north wind, a god of the south wind. And each side of the octagon had a sundial on it that, that faced the appropriate direction to uh, tell time using the sun. So we see that's, that's kind of like a, a timekeeping laboratory. But, but there's nothing written down or, or documenting that these were timekeeping laboratories? No, there's other people that have speculated the same thing as yeah. me about the Tower of the Winds, for instance, the Lighthouse of Alexandria. If we look at the, even the Great Pyramid or all the pyramids, they're oriented to true north or the pole star, that they did have this kind of a, a technology where they could uh, divide property, even using the locations of monuments and measurements from a given point to lay out their fields in Egypt. So, yeah, this is it. It, it hasn't been studied that much, but it's there. And, and when I first started looking into this about I don't know, 12 or 13 years ago, there was little to no information and slowly more and more information is coming out as people get interested in, in the kind of things I've been talking about. This is incredibly fascinating stuff. And this is a good time to take a commercial break. We're talking to Court Lindahl, okay? And uh, his website is called survivalcell.blogspot.com. His YouTube channel is Court Lindahl, L-I-N-D-A-H-L. His Patreon goes by the same name, and his Twitter goes by the same name. You might recognize him from uh, uh, Curse of Oak Island. He's been on there several times. And we'll be right back with more fascinating, incredibly fascinating. We were joking around about doing a radio show. You really should. Now, I'm assuming that your YouTube channel has a lot of uh, images on it, right? Yes, I have over 100 videos there that I produced myself. Right. I, I think you could uh, – your storytelling abilities, I think you would transfer to radio or a podcast very, very well. Now, Court, too. There's a bunch of books here with the name Court Lindell Bradbury. Is that you, too, as well? Yeah, Bradbury is my first name. There you go. Okay. So I just uh, – my, my great-grandfather's name was Court Lindell. And um, 
when I first started writing, I thought I'd do that kind of as an homage to him. But yeah, sometimes I include the Bradbury part there. That's my mother's family. And I was given that for a first name. Now, Court, uh, off the air before we started, I was asking you about the layout of the roads and the streets in Washington, D.C. And is, are there any octagonal structures in D.C. in the Capitol? Well, the, the, the Capitol dome itself has an octagonal like bezel or feature that goes around the bottom rim of the Capitol. And uh, actually a meridian there, a line of longitude that we've been discussing was uh, created there that's almost on the exact 77th uh, degree west of longitude. And that was suggested by Pierre L'Enfant, who uh, created the plan of the Capitol originally. So that's one of them. And then we have the White House meridian as well that uh, Thomas Jefferson had a huge hand in creating, which is an alignment of uh, monuments, including uh, Meridian Hill Park, uh, the famous Washington, D.C. Scottish Rite Lodge, the White House, the, the measurement stone for Washington, D.C., that where all the mileage is compared to as you're approaching the city the Jefferson Memorial, Reagan Airport, Woodrow Wilson Bridge, Fort Washington are all on the White House meridian. What about the Washington Monument? And I've, I mean, First of all, it's an obelisk, and it, you know, there's three major obelisks around the world. One is at the, the Vatican, and the, one's in, the, uh, in England, I believe, right? Uh, now, I, I understand that inside they have tiles of every Masonic Lodge within the, the United States. Well, they do have a, a number of memorial stones in there, and some of them are from Masonic lodges. Some of them are from states, and some of them are just interesting stones. For instance, in my study of the Beale Treasure, which is interesting, which takes place in Bedford uh, County, Virginia, they had a, a stone there from a prominent mountain uh, called the Peaks of Otter that one of the memorial stones is made from that. So that's interesting as well. Other ones are made by civic groups, but yeah, the predominant highest number of them are from Masonic lodges or Masonic organizations. Now, is there a belief that there's some kind of energy in these stones? Because I understand that the, the, the queen sits on a stone, uh, her, uh, her throne is on a stone. Right. Now that stone is supposedly one of the sacred stones from the old temple in Jerusalem is the story of why that stone has power. Yes, so there is a tradition of that, of stone legends. Even sometimes the Holy Grail is referred to as a stone or a stone cup. So there is a, a kind of esoteric belief that a lot of those things do have some kind of energy or meaning, too. That's one thing I find a lot of times when people suggest these more like paranormal uh, explanations for thing if you examine the practical reasons too they do give you information it, you know something could be encoded on some of those memorial stones in there in fact it's interesting that the the Washington Monument was actually moved a, a couple of hundred yards from where it was supposed to be located originally and it would have been right on the White House meridian that I'm talking about, but it got moved a couple of hundred yards uh, to the east because the ground was unstable. It had been swampy previously. So when Jefferson had this White House meridian laid out, he laid these pier stones, which are surveyor's marker, markers that resemble kind of a miniature obelisk. So if you go there to the Washington Monument today, and you go about 200 yards to the west of it, you'll see what's known as the Jefferson Pier Stone. That's the location where the Washington Monument was originally planned to be. So he placed a few of these pier stones up and down the track of the White House Meridian, and two of them are still missing. There's supposed to be one near Meridian Hill Park at the north end of the alignment, which... Uh, actually marks this line of longitude, and that's why it's called Meridian Hill. This is all such fascinating stuff. Uh, what about the whole thing? It's called the District of Columbia, right? And what about the goddess Columbia and all this weird stuff with Columbia? Have you looked into that? Sure, it does oh connect God. to that, yeah. <laughs> and and if, you, if you 
look into the meaning of the word Columba, it means dove. Oh, really? And so we're looking at the dove of peace as another interpretation of that that then got connected to the the goddess of the Statue of Liberty and uh, in other artwork in early America when people were more kind of in tune with those kind of interpretations of patriotism and uh, people were more well-read in Greek mythology or Roman mythology. It wasn't that they were actually worshiping these things. It's that in that day, a lot people lot read a lot more about those kind of things and could appreciate them in that kind of context is my opinion about all of that. I mean, today we have some people suggesting all kinds of things where people are goddess worshiping and and uh, things similar to that. But I think originally all of that was a, a measure of patriotism. What, do, what have you discovered, okay, in all your knowledge and all your research and you, you know, all this time, uh, the, the greatest misconception that people have uh, about a certain thing in history? That's hard to say. There's a lot of those. I well, mean, Let's hear them. What do you got? <laughs> well, a lot of people today believe the Knights Templar came to America, and uh, it, that's really cost me some hits in the media because that's such a popular subject right now. And I examined that in detail and found no real evidence whatsoever that that's true at all. And that's kind of speaks to how a lot of these, you know, kind of strange historical concepts were taken and used for political reasons at various times in American history. I was talking about the, the similar phenomena of people saying that Vikings had built the Newport Tower. And uh, what I found was there was just kind of this not even low-grade racism, uh, a, a lot of that aimed at Christopher Columbus. A lot of people couldn't stand the fact that he was supposedly given credit for discovering, discovering America when we know he didn't actually do that anyway, that we had Columbus Day and all this kind of lionization of the Italian Columbus that, that didn't sit right with certain factions of American people, that they wanted to promote this idea that the Norse had been here long before Columbus. And this is in the era long before they even did discover a Viking site in Newfoundland. Uh, let me ask you a question about Columbus, though, because it's my understanding is that his name was not Christopher Columbus, and, and we don't know what his, really, really know what his name is. Well, I guess it, in Spanish uh, terms, he's Cristobal Colon right. in, instead of Christopher Columbus, but I've never heard that, that theory that you're espousing that he actually was named something different. I haven't read of anything like that. Well, I think I read it in Wikipedia, so don't look at me. <laughs> well, that's possible. <laughs> okay, I know there's all, he's one of those subjects where there's a lot of theories about him, too. Yes. And, uh, you know, a lot of these subjects, you know, become kind of a cash cow, either from the way they're presented on television or people writing books, promoting a certain point of view that seems to appeal to the public more. And, you know, maybe to my detriment, a lot of times I... I don't do things that way. I'll look at a certain concept and I will go look for period sources or the original sources that suggest these things are true, like the Knights Templar coming to America. And what I find is nothing. Like none of these ideas even developed until the 20th century in many cases. In these popular movies like with Nicolas Cage and stuff like that? Right. Now, I'm glad you brought that one up. The National Treasure movies, those are kind of an overblown, uh, distorted version of something that I think is real. Okay. It didn't include the temple treasure or anything like that, but in a few of these kind of interesting mysteries that I've looked at, it, it suggested that like items that were important to American history may have been hidden and an appendant kind of quest armchair treasure hunt <laughs> for lack of a better term was developed where Freemasons might be involved or people from different secret societies to actually go and find these items and uh, things like the Beale treasure uh, the story of the Bruton vault in Williamsburg which espouses that a vault of Sir Francis Bacon's papers were hidden there uh, are part of these things that were intentionally developed 
as kind of a mystery school quest that teaches you things as you go along. And uh, I guess not to go too far off track, but even the recent QAnon craze is a form of the same thing where you give people cryptic clues. It kind of involves their psyche a little bit more than just telling them something where they're compelled to have to solve something. It means more to them. So when you apply that concept to an appreciation of American history, you might hide an original first printing of the Declaration of Independence somewhere and leave clues about where to find it. Like in the Beale treasure, for instance, one of the cipher keys uses the Declaration of Independence to solve that. So So I I found a series of these kind of stories that did involve references to the Declaration of Independence, for example. Now, now before uh, National Treasure and Nick Cage, there was that other book and that other movie. What was that called again? Uh. You know, I don't know. The, no, it was the big rage. Everything they held these clues. And, and, uh, oh, the Da Vinci Code. Da Vinci Code. There you go. Okay. Yes, fine. that's very similar too. And you can see uh, there are examples of, of re- real things like that, where a path of initiation is left out. That's another term from the next Dan Brown movie, the um, Angels and Demons. Right. So those kind of things I did find, there are actual real historical things like that. And a lot of times they're associated in Europe with artist guilds, you know, where, where a lot of times those were the political discussion places of the day. When, when Thomas Jefferson was in France, he attended literary salons with the Marquis de Lafayette in his circle where they were all discussing uh, rep- the formation of republics and the political mores of the day. So a lot of times those kind of concepts do hide real political movements and uh, things associated with that. What, what about – we hear about these uh, – that period of time, uh, groups like the, the Lunar Society and the Hellfire Club? Yes, the Hellfire Club is associated with a lot of the things I've looked at with regard to Shugborough Hall, which is hard to pronounce. <laughs> that that – uh, They used a similar technique, like there's a legend of something being hidden at Shugborough Hall, be it the Holy Grail or the Stone of Destiny, the rock that the Queen sits on that we spoke about. And uh, they used a series of architectural follies that have meaning, if you know the history behind them. Like at Shugborough Hall, they have a replica of the Tower of the Winds of Athens that I discussed before. So Sir Francis Dashwood, who hosted the Hellfire Club, also had a Tower of the Winds on his property and another array of kind of classical Greek and uh, uh, Roman-themed architecture that might might have some hidden meanings to it with the inscriptions that are included in the statuary, that if you understand that, you can begin to see uh, the story he might be telling. So... My my breakdown of the Hellfire Club was almost like it was an intelligence service, like one of the oldest tricks in the books to compromise people Mm. and gather information. And that's why it's interesting that Benjamin Franklin was also associated with that. What do you make of all those bones they found under Franklin's house? Well, I would go with the, the, the straight explanation that he was studying anatomy it wasn't terribly uncommon in those days for cadavers to be um, analyzed where artists would draw pictures of the inner workings of the human body and things like that. But I could also see where uh, people would take that as fodder to turn it into some kind of a horror story about human sacrifice and things like that. But uh, I don't think that's what was going on. And uh, even in the Hellfire Club, when I examined that, it seemed to be more of an effort to gather intelligence information. Uh, Dashwood and Franklin were both intimately associated with the intelligence services of their countries and with even Franklin possibly being part of British intelligence in the days mm. before the revolution. Yeah, it seems possible that blackmail is really the, the oldest profession <laughs> rather than prostitution. Yeah. Yeah, so in intelligence circles, too, that, yeah. that seems to be a kind of normal thing. 
We're running out of time. We only got about four minutes. And, and I apologize because I know I'm asking a lot of stupid questions going all over the place. It's just questions I have in my own head of things that you know I've heard about. And I know you're very knowledgeable in these topics. Uh, what can you tell us about the Stone of Scone? Well, the Stone of Scone is the Stone of Destiny that we've already discussed. Okay. It's the same thing. It's the, the – uh, originally it was a stone that Scottish kings would sit on to be coronated. And after a while, the English crown and the Scottish crown became interrelated to each other, and that was transferred to, to London, where modern English monarchs sit on that stone as well. Now, originally, that was said to be one of the teraphim, or the sacred stones of the temple in Jerusalem that went missing along with the temple treasure, the famous that's one of the archetypes of all treasure stories right there is the, the temple treasure missing from the uh, temple of Jerusalem. So that in, in itself inspired a lot of other treasure stories, including recently people have you know begun to concentrate it more on the teraphim or the sacred stones that they had there, one of them being the pillow stone of Jacob where he falls asleep and has the dream about ascending the stairway to heaven and uh, that story and that's the stone of scone in theory and we don't know obviously if it's actually the real one but in concept that's at least what it represents with them I'm sure believing that it actually is the real stone from the temple incredible font of knowledge here my friend I'm very impressed um, we only got about two or three minutes left what do you want to leave us with well, thanks for having me on. It's good to, to talk about these things and kind of expose new things. And um, how Thomas Jefferson was involved is interesting because in Williamsburg, there was another Tower of the Winds copy known as the Powder Magazine there, which is an octagonal structure. And uh, I think that's what inspired him to build his octagons, ultimately, in part, that his family tradition and that he knew what that structure in Williamsburg represented. So that uh, was one of the first realizations I made that led to all of these other things. When we, Jefferson studied land surveying at the College of William and Mary when he attended. So I believe they even used the powder magazine there as kind of an instruction for people in the know that they would have something like that to compare to other places in Europe and other locations where that concept was appreciated. So that was kind of put there intentionally at the college or near the College of William and Mary to help that kind of initiate them into that. And sure as heck, later, we see Jefferson being involved in similar things during his time in France. Real quick question. I've, I'm fascinated that Jefferson studied land surveying. Uh, do we see now today the people, the, the people in power have a history of studying land surveying? I would say not today, but in right. the past, there was, there was, that was much more common. In fact, a lot of these, quote, mysteries that I see over time involve somebody schooled in that art. And that's why I think these structures were used as kind of like a datum or place from which to measure that even, even people who develop later treasure stories may have used. Just incredible. Fascinating information. I'm so sorry we're out of time. We're talking to Court Lindahl. His blog is survivalcell.blogspot.com. That's C-E-L-L. -L. His YouTube channel is Court, C-O-R-T, Lindahl, L-I-N-D-A-H-L. Uh, he's got a Patreon with exclusive content, and I really encourage you to go there and support his Patreon so he can do more research and get more information for us. Twitter channel, you can find him on Facebook, where I'm friends with him. Uh, uh, also, too, any more appearances coming up on uh, uh, Oak Island? Uh, not that I'm, I know of. I'm always in touch <laughs> with those guys, and who knows, they might uh, gain an interest in something I said. It's possible. Excellent. Court Lindell, thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Ed. I really appreciate it. I'm glad we finally got this together. Yeah, me too, man. Thank you very much. Good night.